right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kayvon Mishayek. I'm the founder of Producers Without Borders. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, Marché du Film and Jérôme Payard and Gu uh, Guillaume Esmiol for giving us this incredible opportunity today to talk about something that's uh, a very, very wonderful concept that a lot of people are not familiar with, but we're going to dive right into it. Uh, I would like to take this time to introduce my esteemed guest, Professor of Mathematics at UC Berkeley, Dr. Edward Frankel. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's a winner of the Herman Weil Prize in Mathematical Physics. His latest book, Love and Math, was an international bestseller in 19 languages worldwide. And he's also co-directed a short film called The Rights of Love and Math, which not only he starred in, but he also co-directed. But the most important thing about Dr. Frankel, I've known him for 11 years, and he was recruited at age 21 to be a professor at Harvard University. So please put your hands together for him. I'd really like to thank you, Dr. Frankel for being here today. So I'm not a scientist, I'm not a mathematician, but I'm gonna jump into it right away because uh, there was a very famous individual named Nietzsche who uh, in his book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, said that mankind will someday be surpassed by the uberman, the superman. Uh, so this is something that is on the forefront of many people's uh, conscious as we move forward that brings us to the title of this subject which is new cinematic heroes in the age of artificial intelligence dr. Frankel what does that mean to you well first of all thank you um, Kevin for this introduction uh, thank you Marcia du film for having us and thank you all for coming uh, to this event it's uh, we're, we're very ex excited to, to talk about the subject and um, it's actually uh, it's an interesting question because uh, Nietzsche wrote that book, published that book in a, you know at the end of the 19th century, so quite a long time ago. And it's, I take it as a kind of a challenge to all of us in a sort of the, around the world, but especially in a sort of a Western tradition in the Western world. Uh, what is it like? What is what is it? What is this Ubermensch? What is this Superman is going to look like? And obviously, a lot of interesting developments happened in the, you know, since the book was published. But I think we are still trying to answer this question. And I think it kind of gets a different um, connotation, a different context today in this, what I would like to call the age of AI, artificial intelligence, by, by which I mean the world governed by technology, the world in which we live today, in which, um, I would say most aspects of our lives are determined by algorithms. They're invisible, they're running somewhere in the background, you know, and to a large extent uh, determine our, our tastes, our desires, our fears. So what would it be like, I would say, the question I would like to pose, um, what would it be like to create a film uh, in this age of technology, in this age of AI, a film that would expose this character, Ubermensch, um, a Superman. Of course, speaking about this subject, um, I have to mention the great film by the great director Stanley Kubrick, 2001, A Space Odyssey, 54 years ago, 1968, just to make sure that we understand the connection between Nietzsche's book and this film, Kubrick, of course, uses the Thus Spoke Zarathustra by Richard Strauss, the famous uh, mu uh, music sequence in, in that film. And I think he probably, I don't think anyone has come closer than Kubrick in, uh, in answering the question, in, in creating a film uh, that addresses the question. And so, of course, it shows the, the main character, Dave, Dave Bowman, and his journey. And so, in that, in that sense, 
you 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 agree with that, Kevin? Yes, I'm I'm fascinated by why the, where this is going because I have a million questions I want to ask to follow up. Yeah, but, so I don't, but I don't want to keep no, no, going. No, no, I no, no, this keep is going. actually very good. This is actually very good. In, I, in my professorial sort of mode. No, no, no. You know? it, it, it's wonderful because was, what I was going to ask is, you know, we're now reaching an age where uh, algorithms are are created to to uh, to write scripts and to create characters, and we're, we're ha this heavy reliance on algorithms to create stories that will sell because you're now in a film market and in a film market the only thing important to distributors and our marketers or films is how is this going to be relevant to an audience if we're going to sell this product so the, the the discussion here is when we're creating these new cinematic heroes for the age of artificial intelligence where is the balance between the humanity of something and and that what the science wants us to do which is sell a product we are at, at the end of the day we're all here to sell a product. It's, it's, film has become commoditized and with the streaming world we have an abundance of channels to push this product out there. So there's opportunities out there to, but what I wanted you to talk about from a, from a, from a scientist standpoint is the fact that you're looking at it from the perspective of a person who is uh, enveloped in a world where the numbers and algorithms are, are important to you because there's the truth in that. Well, at least that's what we per perceive, and that's what kind of most scientists kind of pro project that certainty that, uh, to paraphrase, you know, the great Pythagoras, uh, all is a number. He, he's, he's, he's said to, he is uh, believed to have said that 2,500 years ago, which I kind of take as the beginning of the countdown of the, of the Western civilization, because that's the, uh, this idea of knowledge, the idea that every question has an answer. The idea that you can conceptualize, uh, you can uh, reify the uh, um, reason, you have, can use logic, you can be rational, and everything can be ac accessed in this way. So I'm not surprised that today, with the development of technology, filmmakers attempted to rely on technology more and more and to use, for instance, algorithms and artificial intelligence. So, but wasn't it you that told me also that you know reliance on that kind of thing is the uh, it, it, you you become well, so that's where I'm going okay so as a mathematician I want to tell you well experiment with it use it as a tool but don't think of this as a measure of last resort don't think of it as the final answer for a very simple reason that an algorithm first of all it's some it's something that is finite it's a, the computer program is always finite nobody has ever seen an infinite computer program, right? So an algorithm is always finite. It's always rel relying on what has been known, that what we know from the past. And if we only use what we know, what was done before, we will never reach new frontiers, right? So l let me put it slightly differently. A program is a sequence of zeros and ones. And so zeros and ones are like yes and no. So you ask questions and you answer yes or no, yes or no. But what about paradoxes? Modern science tells us that the world is paradoxical in the sense that, um, let's say, an elementary particle, an electron, is it, is it, we call it a particle, but is it a particle? No, it's not, because you can set up an experiment where it behaves as a wave. So is it a wave? No, it's not a wave either. So it's something in between. It's something which is beyond. And, you know, um, as uh, Soren uh, Kierkegaard, uh, the great uh, Danish philosopher, said, a thinker without paradox uh, is like a lover without passion. So if you just make your film, if you, if you relinquish your authority to an algorithm, you, how are you going to have paradoxes in it? It's going to be something that is um, bland, something that is is not going to have passion in it. So, so that's one of the things that I kind of feel that kind of a message from a mathematician, from a scientist, because I think a lot of scientists, unfortunately, today, um, how shall we say, misinform the public, telling us sometimes that you know, a human being is just a, is just a collection of element of particles that are based on mathematical equations, or that our life is an algorithm, or that the love is a chemical reaction. Well, I, I'm here to tell you that there is a lot more. <laughs> so from a scientific point of view, from a scientific point of view, and so going back to the original question that you posed about the uh, Ubermensch, 
I think it's actually useful to think about it in the context of another book that Nietzsche wrote, which is called The Birth of Tragedy, in which we talk, he talked about this polarity in our psyche between what he referred to as a province of the god Apollo, and that's reason, logic, uh, you know, um, uh, rational thinking, thinking, basically, thinking, knowledge, trying to accumulate, trying to understand, kind of a left, what we usually say, proverbial left brain activity. And um, on the opposite end is the province of the god Dionysus, which is um, uh, about feeling, about emotion, about imagination, about intuition. Also enjoying, enjoying life, because he was also god of wine. Being here in Cannes, obviously, we can appreciate <laughs> that. So, <laughs> but how do we f strike that balance? I think when, when so, the, so, being, so being, so Ubermensch, I would say, is someone who can strike balance between these two sides, between these two polarities. And oftentimes what I see is today is that when we, when we uh, rely too much on, on, uh, on logic and reason, we are kind of mo going too far in the, uh, in the Apollo's direction, but, which is not good because we are losing some, some things. And in fact, sci great scientists have always known this. Albert Einstein famously said, imagination is more important than knowledge for knowledge is limited, whereas imagination makes the world go round, you see. So you know that as a scientist, you, you learn that all the great discoveries in the history of science were not linear, kind of like, were not part of a linear, slow, slow process. They were always, there were always jumps. There were always jumps and they were always products of imagination and intuition and not just mere knowledge. In other words, they transcend knowledge, they go beyond knowledge. And so, but Dr. Fung, I want to cut you, cut you yes. off real quick. It's just one of the things that this triggers in my mind is the influence of, the, the, uh, of what uh, artificial intelligence has brought to, the, to our lives today. Uh, while it, technology makes our lives easier, at the same time, it, it, it creates this slave-like behavior right. that we have towards it. I mean, we have this trust in everything that's technology-based, right. that it's supposed to be the thing that's going to make our life not only better, more efficient, and more clear, but also our reliance on it allows us to remove ourselves from our old self, which is right. the humanity part that we need to create something that's real, that's authentic. And we're missing that little, that fabric that, right. that, that can So I would say we delegate, we delegate our authority too much to, to, the, to those who know, who are in the know. In part because I, I think it's, it, it's, uh, it's, you know, due to the, the really atrocious state of our mathematics education and science education in general. But it's it, so that people going through the grinder of, you know, math, math courses in school, they, they, they believe that it's something beyond their comprehension and they are really scared of it. So naturally then, someone who seems to have mastered the subject appears as, an, as a superman. And that's not the case because you know, I, I represent, <laughs> these are my people. And I can say, I can tell you that, yes, I do know mathematics, but this is not enough because with, no, with knowledge of the subject comes also, a, a, and over over emphasizing it ca, come limitations and misunderstanding also, over. In my opinion, it also it makes you incredibly, you have to be morally responsible with this information. Right. And sometimes and that is not on, on, something that's taught. And we have not yet, as scientists, gotten to the place where we have fully appreciated the power of what we do, where I w I sometimes, you know, I say the mathematical formula sometimes ca can have a power greater than the power of an atomic bomb. Uh, but atomic bomb is visible when it explodes or, or, or a missile, but uh, the formula is, is hiding somewhere behind in the darkness. And so what I would like to say is don't, don't, don't um, relinquish your authority, don't relinquish your agency to the, those in the know, to the nerds, so to speak, to the, to the, to the captains of, of technology or the captains of Silicon Valley. Because I see it too often and hear it too often when people say, oh, I would love, uh, you know, Elon Musk to, to, put, uh, to put a neural link in my brain, you know? So because obviously the guy is successful, he knows something that I don't know, so, you know, maybe he is the Superman. But remember uh, Dave Bowman in 2001, what happened? when they had uh, uh, the computer, the great computer, artificial intelligence computer, HAL, HAL 9000, wanted to keep, it's a, the, when, you get, when you go too far, 
in the direction of Apollo. Mm -hmm. And when you ignore Dionysus, you do it at your own peril because that is the path to death. So the computer tries to destroy the humans on board. So, so can you give us a couple of examples historically of, of things that, uh, characters that you've seen in movies that you can relate to uh, that have that balance uh, between the Dionysian and, uh, uh, and uh, excuse me, the uh, Apollonian and the Dionysian? That's right. Can you give us an example of that? So Dave Bowman, obviously a, fi a fictional character, as far as we know, um, he has to connect to his humanity, he has to connect to his other side. And he sort of goes analog on, on, this, on this computer and he goes with the screwdriver and you know, manually removes the, the modules from the computer to stop it. And that's when he transcends those, one could say, self-imposed limitations of his, to me, HAL 9000 is an extension of sort of the left side of his brain. Uh, you know, I mean a proverbial left brain. Of course, we know from uh, scientists, neuroscientists, that it's not exactly divided between left what and right. But it's an extension of that side, that thinking side, that analyzing side, that side that relies on, on logic and rationality and, and reason. When it goes too far and kind of eclipses uh, the other side, that leads to tragedy. And so for him, he, had to he has to restore balance. He has to reconnect to this other side, to his imaginative, intuitive side. And that's when, you know, a star child is born. So star child, to me, is, symbolizes the Uberman. What other historical characters can you think right. about that, that, that kind of brings us to this? So, so I've been thinking about this, actually. And uh, I don't, so in other words, who are, in history, who are, can, can we point to someone who has actually been able to, to, to strike that, bal that balance. So for, to me, for instance, Pythagoras, who is one of my heroes, I would say is on, the, on the Apollo side, um, all is a number. Also, he didn't believe in infinity. He did not believe that uh, there is such a thing, that everything's finite. Now, naturally, in our experiences, you know, Everything we, we observe is finite. Even the number of atoms in the observed universe is finite. Uh, it's very large, but finite. And so the question is whether infinity actually exists. And it's interesting because, um, well, there is this quote from Carl Jung who said that actually that's the most important question for a human being, whether he or she is connected to something infinite or not. Because only when one feels that infinity is actually available to us to connect right now, that we can forego kind of a spurious and inessential things and focus on what matters. Mathematicians have a very interesting approach to infinity. We postulate it as an axiom, you see. So mathematics can neither prove or nor disprove the existence of infinity. You can adopt a system of axioms in which you do have infinity, you postulate, and by infinity I mean the collection of all natural numbers, one, two, three, four, five, as one entity. That's much stronger than saying for every number there is a number greater by one. So for a thousand there is a thousand one, for a billion there is billion and one. That's what we call potential infinity. The actual infinity is saying all of these numbers, all natural numbers, the collection of all natural numbers exists as, a, as an entity. Let's let's talk about some movies that you can uh, right. that you can relate to. I'm getting there. Sorry, to be a little yeah, bit it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, there's uh, I mean, Christopher Nolan's film, for example. But I, I was mean, going to say something else. So th there is another mathematician. So Pythagoras did not believe in infinity. And to me, infinity is that is that which distinguishes Apollo and Dionysus. The idea that yes, infinity is real. In mathematics, we accept it as an axiom. And the reason we do that is because it's a pragmatic reason, because mathematics becomes richer, uh, has greater diversity. We can prove a lot more when we postulate that infinite sets, infinite collections of numbers exist. So a mathematician who actually um, accepted that and also was one of the first ones to talk seriously about what's called irrational numbers, numbers which cannot be expressed as ratios, not because they are irrational in, ter in their behavior, but because they are not ra rational. Means ra rational means ratio of two integers, like two, two thirds or five, six. It was a Persian mathematician, 
Amar Khayyam, who lived in the 11th century, he was actually born on May 18th. May 18th, almost, 1048. Almost today, uh, yesterday. And you came out, actually, you, what brought us together, what, 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 you know, we met, you and I met, because of a film you made uh, called The Keeper, The Legend of Amar Khayyam, about this great uh, Persian scientist. But he was, he, he was a mathematician and uh, opened new frontiers in mathematics beyond Pythagoras, like I said, but also he was an astronomer and created the first calendar, which was actually even more precise than the calendar we use uh, in the Western world, the Gregorian calendar. So, but he was also a poet. His famous book of poems uh, called Rubaiyat, in which he talked about love, he talked about carpe diem, about living in the now, living in the moment. So to me, he was the example of the he Apollonian was, he exemplifies, yeah. exemplifies more than yeah. anyone I can think of uh, that Ubermensch, that, that, and what a great power you guys have, uh, you know, filmmakers. I, I'm here speaking as a, as a movie goer, so I'm not part of the industry, so to speak. I, and I understand that there are all the pressures, uh, uh, like you said, the, the, the pressures to, to, to make money, the pressures to sell and so on and to optimize, but as a movie goer, maybe it's a good idea to remind, you know, all of us, especially remind you guys, uh, the film professionals and filmmakers, what is, this is all about, ultimately. It's about inspiring us, the movie goers. And what a great way to inspire us is to, sh as, for instance, to show a journey of a, of a man like, uh, of a, or, or a human being like uh, Amar Khayyam, which, actually begs the question, how did you come to make this film? Well, that's a long, long story, but uh, the film Which, actually, by the way, was, he, was it premiered in the market here in 2004. But uh, the, my main motivation was a very personal thing. I didn't know mathematician. My father was a mathematician, so I didn't understand mathematics as well as I should. And so I wanted to create a character that actually talked exactly about the concepts he's talking about, the Dionysian and Apollonian, the, the yin and the yang of, of the struggle that we all have of trying to, to be that person where we can feel, we can think, we can be uh, uh, revelrous, if you want, but at the same time be logical, because that's that th that dance is amongst all of us. So the characters that we're trying to create today, with the way that we're trying to create movies, was was not available to me at the time I was trying to make. You actually my film. you actually filmed it on location. I, I filmed in it in Uzbekistan. In Uzbekistan, in, in, which in Samarkand and Bukhara, where he lived, worked, and studied in the 11th century, but. Beyond, above and beyond all that, what, what, what's, what's amazing is through the past 20 years of how you're seeing the natural progression of these characters and these amazing filmmakers like Christopher Nolan, which I think is the next uh, Stanley Kubrick, you know, as far as the way he, he puts such deep meaning and deep characters that, it, that his movies are so layered in, in such a way that you have to watch it over and over and over again to pick up the nuances. So, so they are informed by science, right? So for instance, Interstellar. But the most important thing is, yes. are they authentic and real enough that I can relate to them? If there's somebody that's just a scientist sitting there doing numbers, I'm not gonna be able to re relate to that. So there has to be some kind of human characteristic to this person right. to have a frailty, to have a weakness, to have a subtlety about them where you know I'm not just relying on an algorithm or something that's going to make me watch it because he's smart. I don't, you know, right. I mean, that's, there, there's one, one but, thing but about all, that. And likewise, not being informed by science, in, in other words, going too far in the Dionysian direction, right. that's not good either, right? But, so, but also, there's another thing that I'm, I'm worried about, is, is what is the, pro I mean, what's the impact of this on children? If you're a person who has kids, and, you know, and you're seeing where AI is taking things, and the characters that, the, that are being created to service the cell, what responsibility do we have as filmmakers to say, you know what, maybe we need to show that all of that, there's some frailty, there's some bad stuff about that, that if you don't check it, um, it's, it's gonna go in the wrong direction. Now, now I think the purpose of this talk really was, is, was to, to let him, uh, what Edward talk about is the moral responsibility of scientists and how do they want to be portrayed and, the, and, and what, how are they going to be trained in the future to, to have that balance, to know the yin and the yang within, amongst them? Right. right. So yin and yang is another, another right. way, uh, way to express that same polarity, seeming polarity. 
uh, of these two sides of the human world, human psyche. But you know, there is an interesting paradox that a lot of scientists are informed by the uh, developments of science of the 20th century and the 21st century, which um, show beyond the shadow of a doubt that you know the observer and the observed are inextricably linked, that the idea of determinism that somehow we are all collections of particles which move like billiard balls according to some no laws of physics, that this is, uh, this is completely false. That contradicts uh, uh, the modern theories of science, quantum theory, Einstein's relativity theory, Gödel's incompleteness, and so on. So there are a lot of scientists who are actually well informed of that, but when they are asked by, you know, like a popular magazine about these issues, I've, I've heard some people say, oh, you're just a collection of elementary particles which move according to uh, some mathematical equations, uh, as, uh, uh, expressing a point of view of the 19th century, which has been thoroughly debunked, you see. So what does it show us? It show, shows us also the, the limitations of my breed, so to speak, of my people. And I, I, I can attest to that because ultimately what I realized, you know, like in later, later years, so, you know, first half of life, you kind of try to achieve, you try to uh, be, be the best mathematician you can be and so on. But at some point, a moment of reflection comes, a moment of intrans introspection. And what I realized is I went to mathematics because I did not want to deal with the real world. I was afraid of it due to various experiences that, that I, went through as a child and so I wanted to find this pure world of you know platonic world of mathematical ideas and just live there so and I believe that this is quite common so now for someone like that who is not in touch with their sort of other sides would you want them to design you know video games for your children would you want to give, surrender to them your authority or would you would you want them to guide your children into the future now of I think, course, I think one of the great they are on their own journeys, obviously, of self-discovery. I think one of the great questions that was posed by you to me uh, is, is like, how many, of us, how many of us out there believe that life is really an algorithm? Yeah, that's right. I mean, so think about it. So forget how about many, those people. Uh, like, how many people in the audience actually believe that life is an algorithm? I was asked by a great writer, Tom Wolfe, this question years, you know, a few years ago. And I, I, I could almost feel in my body this this impulse to say yes life is an algorithm because how great because i'm a mathematician so now i become your guru right you will come to me <laughs> because i have all the answers right right but of course i know that that's not the case however i know it not from a third person perspective that science today science offers i know it from my personal experience from first person exper uh, uh, perspective right but Movies are supposed to convey those first-person perspectives. And all of us, if we go deep down if, you know, in the heart of hearts, we know that there is something infinite. We know that there is something beyond knowledge and rationality and logical thinking. So I think it's important to convey that in our movies, in our films. And of course, great directors do. And at the same time, not to fall in the trap of thinking that we have already created the Ubermensch in the, in a, in a, you know, as the, the ones who run the technology, who write the algorithms, because I am here to testify that we are not. Right, so my, 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 my follow-up question to that, what would you like to see filmmakers do to portray scientists like yourself on film? So that there's a level of authenticity for you that, that you feel like, wow, they're getting it right now. I mean, the, the only person I can think of out there in the modern era that's doing this on a large scale is Christopher Nolan. I keep using that as an example because he's, he's been highly influential in how other filmmakers you know, approach the subject. What would you like to see? Well, so that's a very good, that's a very good question. So what I would that's like to see is an exploration bucks. of this new character. So to me, this is a new character, uh, someone who is a, a scientist, a mathematician, a nerd, if you will. And I mean it as a compliment, you know. So, who, and we, the nerds, have amassed this incredible power today because, it, and I don't think it's ever happened in the history of humanity, that suddenly, and most of us are invisible. We don't, we don't go walk on the red carpet. And yet, we write those algorithms and we create those programs, which, as we discussed earlier, um, are so influential today. So what is the 
origin of this of someone like that? How did they come to this place? Uh, you know, we mentioned two great books by Nietzsche, but it's a good moment to mention also uh, a book which I think uh, most film professionals are well aware of, the Joseph Campbell's A Hero with a Thousand Faces. Hero's journey. Now, there are many different journeys, but it's a very particular journey, a journey of someone, um, you know, this type of character, someone who comes to, to, to possess this knowledge, which now is so highly prized, but yet is limited in other ways. And, and to see that limitation is also to help them to transcend it. Now, you could say, well, uh, you, so what, you're making a movie for a small audience of nerds so that they go and see themselves and maybe uh, come to the point where they start looking you know, within themselves, within, you know, in Well, it, that's not so bad this day and age because if but, you find a viral audience and you get them to, to, to attach themselves to that subject, this is, the, this is actually the benefit side of it because at the end of the day, there's so much content being but, created and if you have a, your audience that's going to follow you... But my point is that as a society, if we don't analyze it, if we don't ask these questions, then we don't create. It, it means that we are, we are oblivious of it. We are, we are asleep. We don't understand what's going on. So then, that cre in other words, if... If the nerds are becoming more aware of themselves, it's only going to happen at the same time as the society is becoming more aware of who is running this show, so to speak. Who is running the matrix, you know, to use a proverbial sort of uh, uh, expression. And I, you know, a great respect for the matrix, you know, like obviously I, I use my, you know, I have an iPhone and an iPad and a, and a laptop and so, uh, uh, but however, my point is, is there is more, there is more. And the filmmakers, to me, are the, at the forefront, should be at the forefront of this exploration. Now, there are, and I don't see those characters in the movies yet, or at least very few, so notable exceptions. You, see, you ask right. me what right. other films. Yeah. Uh, there are Aronofsky's Spy, which was, I guess, early 90s, mm -hmm. a kind of a black and white dark film, showing that character, but kind of stopping short from the from the transformation to going uh, it was too far to the to the apollo side and of course uh, spoiler alert you know he kills himself right so that's what i was talking about earlier well, it was also a beautiful mind there's a beautiful uh, mind another similar similar inception story yeah i wouldn't put inception in, in this to me a great film in this direction in this area was uh, imitation game about Alan Turing, who was a father of modern computing. It was a very honest and candid film, but this is a real character, a, a real person. So it, 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 it does go into kind of the place of where he contemplates his life and understands his limitations. These, these are great examples, though, but now we're talking about moving into the future with artificial intelligence and, and relinquishing that to, to a machine to do that right. thinking well, for us based yeah. on those movies that were successful. So now those, those movies that were successful are algorithmized, I don't know. Or, but or, that, or, that to me... That, is, that to me is a little bit troubling is, because as, the influence it will have down the line is, yeah. Well, w given what we just said, to me that would be sort of becoming a, a filmmaker becoming a full subsidiary of the Matrix, so to speak. Yeah. And, you know, in other, but use the tools. And also I would like to say just to so that I'm not misunderstood. I do think that we want, I think it's a great pursuit to experiment uh, with uh, uh, films created by artificial intelligence. And actually by my dear friend, Al Grafi Al, Al, Al uh, is here, who has done a tremendous work and pioneering work in this direction. I applaud that. Um, the concern I have is to say that that's the only thing that we should do, that we should focus on that and use it as a driving force for our films, because that will keep us in the, in the past. It will keep us in what will, it has already been done, what, has already, what we have already understood, and that's limited. It will not allow us to do, go to the next frontiers, right? So use it as a tool, but don't become the slave of this tool. Right. Okay. So... Um Another question I was going to ask you is, uh, so who do you think are uh, the, the filmmakers that are, um, could, in the, in the next, um, I, I get next chapter of filmmaking um, universe, could, could benefit with, from, from this type of education that you're talking about? But by the way, it doesn't have to be uh, something serious, so to speak. It can be a comedy. So for, I found it very refreshing and 
fascinating in the, in, 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 the, in the context of what I was talking about, the, the, the Big Bang Theory, the TV series which ended a couple of years ago, because to me that actually showed that, 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 that hero's journey. Uh, that, you know, these guys who were these Caltech, you know, nerds, uh, who were very much up in their left brain, so to speak, but eventually, with the help of the women in their lives, obviously, they were able to, um, to, to open up to other dimensions in life. And, you know, there's a beautiful, the, the, the final episode I thought was very beautiful and exactly in not necessarily showing us an Ubermensch, but showing us that process of transformation, that process of transcending the knowledge and, and, and restoring the balance between yin and yang or, or the Apollo and Dionysus or, or love and math for that matter. Well, uh, yeah, and ba ba the reason I was asking that question is like I'm starting to see a lot more documentaries that are uh, aligned with, with what you're talking about. One was The Social Dilemma, I believe. Showing the shows dangers. The da showing that's the dangers right. of all that. So, it's a beautiful uh, it's film, kinda, absolutely. It, 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 and, and so what, what I really want to know is uh, I'd like to get your two takeaways since we're running out of time is what you would like uh, to, the filmmakers of the future to know from your perspective and what you would like to see. I know you kind of, you, you talked about it in a general way. I want two specific things that you would like to see uh, and how, if, I, if I'm a filmmaker right now, if I'm, if I'm a film distributor, if I'm a film financier, and I want to make sure that it, it, this project has the stamp of approval of somebody of your, you know, incredible knowledge and, and background so that it validates and has an authenticity about it that can resonate internationally, what would that be? Give me those two things. Is that a different only, question? Only two things? Well, you run out, out of time, so we can do, do this on the Q&A. We're not on yet, the, we're not <laughs> yet <laughs> But I would like to see the, uh, it's a new, I would like to, you know, to use, to use uh, Carl, Jung, uh, Carl Jung's terminology. There's a new, I, I see them as new archetypes, the archetypes of this sort of captains of technology or the mathematicians, the nerds, the, the ones who write the algorithms who create those programs that influence our lives to such an extent today. I would like to see more of an exploration of their psyche, of their journey. And I would like to see them getting to that point where they are the masters of their subject. And then suddenly they realize that there are other parts of life which are maybe not yet open to them. And they become, and that the gaze turns inside and they learn, start learning more about themselves and how they got to this point so that they can transcend that knowledge that they have accumulated, but still being informed by that knowledge. So they're not, they're not, they're, their thinking does not become mystical or magical. It is still sol on the solid ground of science, but it is still open to other dimensions, to intuition, imagination, uh, love, you know? So I would like to see that shown in, and I think film uh, movies have a great capacity to explore that and to show it to us. And we as viewers will, will sympathize and empathize with these characters, will live through that journey, but also see their limitations, which is something very serious and very important. Well, of course, I mean, the odyssey of emotions that you're talking about when it comes to character development uh, requires a level of thinking and a level of analysis that sometimes our, our, us humans can't really put our hand on when we're trying to create something. So with the help of technology, sometimes that technology can remind us from our past experiences, from our past way of creating content about, hey, how about this? So I think there is a valid you know, um, balance and trying to find that balance is really what it's all about. Finding the, finding the balance. And uh, so I would say yes, so that's, that, that's probably. The, the the thing that I was since you know coming from from this, I'd like subject. to take, take maybe one or two questions because I know we're yes sir right in the front, so uh, there's a there's a there, yeah yeah I'm right there coming right at you. Hello, yes. there you go. Now I am. Uh, so my name is Eliel. I'm, I'm I'm one of your people. I'm a theoretical physicist, um, and and I had I have one question, but before that question, also I, I wanted to react a bit with with something you mentioned. Uh, and, and uh, I do agree that, that your story about finding refuge in a platonic world would resonate with a lot of us. And in fact, it does with me as well. But at the same time, there's a lot of us that uh, somewhat paradoxically, which is very powerful, we are also trying to tame the complexity of how the universe works, how nature works, not only control, but also understand. You know, we are, we are excited to figure out how nature works, how the universe works. So this is kind of like, 
We want to understand how the universe works by being somewhat abstracted from it, and it's paradoxical, but I just wanted to mention that, that perhaps it's not such a bad idea. We are not completely disconnected. I'm not saying that it's a bad idea. It is a great impulse of a human uh, mind, of a human being, to explore and to understand, to learn, to, um, to reduce things to, to s some regularities, to some laws, to some equations. Absolutely, without it, we wouldn't have this technology. We would not be able to stream this event, you know, around the world. I would not be able to read text messages on my, on my phone. So, but well, all I'm saying is that there is more. There is something that's, that's not all. That's not the end. And that actually connects to my question, so to let take less time. And I agree with everything you said, but at the same time, this urge of science to try to tame the universe is also taken us to the point where we have understood that maybe algorithms, equations, is not just enough. And at least my, my point of view of AI is that our, it is our first baby step to try to depart from an algorithmic description of how we solve problems computationally. So an AI is the first time that we've ever, in computer science, had something that we build and that we don't know what it does. Normally programs are algorithmic in the sense that you, the programmer, you tell the program what to do. So the programmer knows what the program does. Right now with machine learning and artificial intelligence, we're reaching the point where we have systems that the builders themselves, they don't know how they do what they do, they don't know what they can do, and, and it's this extra, extra level of trying to baby step, of trying to put this complexity beyond equations. To well, a it's still equations. It's actually uh, the, uh, the neural networks you're referring to ultimately are based on, on the 19th century mathematics or, you know, even earlier, the basically steepest descent method, um, and which I kind of always find funny when people like, um, you know, uh, the, the deep mind uh, CEO, uh, uh, Demis Kasabi, says that we have found the meta solution to all problems in the world. And I'm, as a mathematician, I'm thinking, really? And it's done with 19th century mathematics? You know, it's like, a, in other words, yes, it, it, is, it, goes be, it's, it does, goes beyond, does go beyond uh, the mere uh, a program uh, where it, 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 creating this sort of uncertainty element in the computation. But ultimately, it is still a computation. It is still an attempt to say that everything, in other words, as long as you just expand and you try to solve problems with it, this is fine. Where I have a issue with it is a st with a statement that everything can be accessed in this way, or maybe with some small modifications of it. I find this honestly unbelievable and contradicting to my personal experiences. And I think I understand why someone, and you know, you use this word tame. What is this taming? Where does it come from? I want to control. Why? Because I want to be secure. I want to know what's going to happen, so I want to tame it. But is this, the, is this the only way to live? So we build these cathedrals, and then we destroy them with the bombs that we build with the same technologies, basically, right? So are we always in this uh, cut up in, in this, yeah. in this Infinite wheel loop. of samsara? <laughs> you know? yeah. Or are there other ways to approach life? We don't have to tame things, you know? But we just explore and, and enjoy and play with it. Yeah. Thank you so much. I don't want to. I could um, go for, um, for hours, wanna, but I'm going to. I know we go. can go on forever. I just want to make sure with the market. We're Thank okay, you for this we, for this question. We have one, uh, yeah, more, one more question. We have we have one time for one more question. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Hey, Kevin and Edward. It was so timely to have this uh, chat. It's amazing um, to be talking about this. And I want to back you up, um, Edward, on how the algorithms are limited, and um, they lack auth authenticity in a way, but however, they have become so good at faking it. So the way they learn is, uh, for example, by association between words or by images to words. Um, and so aren't we doing something similar as well by sometimes faking emotions and putting them in films? So where do we draw the lines between the algorithm fakers and the human emotional fakers? Well, can I answer? I'd yeah. like to jump in real that, That's a very good, interesting point because in the world and of. And that's the, that's the allography right. that, I'll, that but, I mentioned but, earlier, the with pioneering uh, right. filmmaker. So, filmmaker. Just remember, in the world of filmmaking, everything is fake. Okay, unless it's a documentary, everything is fake. And it's, it's to create that emo It's the, the purpose is two things to make you think and to make you feel. And most importantly, for a distributor or somebody who's that, is to sell it. 
to sell it so it, it rings true to you. So from, that's from the, from, the, from the fictional way of making movies and not, not, not the documentary way of making movies. So yes, if, if an algorithm can do that and can create that, well, by all means, they're, they're gonna be, it's going to be keep on being used and used and used and used. But what's the responsibility aspect of it is, is, is uh, the discussion that we're having. What, where do you draw the line? And the draw the line thing is hard to tell because you're in a world now where monetizing things becomes more and more difficult and more and more challenging for producers and content creators. And, 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 and that's always going to be a discussion that's going to go ad infinitum. So go ahead and finish it and take us out, well, Dr. Frank. I, would, I usually say, when we, I have this discussion, I usually say, let's suppose that today uh, computers and uh, AI algorithms can imitate or fake, like you said. And by the way, yes, we do fake things, obviously. As humans, that's part of human nature. There's nothing shameful about it, I mean, up to a point. Let's suppose computers can imitate 99% of what I can experience as a human being. Okay. Now, what is more important to me, those 99% or the remaining 1%? And that's, I have asked this question to various people, and there could be different answers. So it's important to know that at least it's not 100%. Maybe it's 99.9, .9, but it's not 100%. So there is something. There is that sliver. But that, in that sliver could be a whole infinity. It could be hiding in it. You know, our feelings, our emotions. And in other words, okay, but... What does it make you happy? You know, so are you happy being imitated? And so, in this in this regard, I wanted to quote from Amar Khayyam, the great Persian mathematician, astronomer, and poet. And I think this is relevant to this discussion, but also to 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 being here at this beautiful place in Cannes at the Cannes Film Festival. He wrote in one of his poems, "Drink wine. This is life eternal." This is all that youth will give you. It is the season for wine, roses, and drunken friends. Be happy for this moment. This moment is your life. And with that, we're gonna take it out. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much.